The Commodore VIC-20. I have mixed feelings. While I fondly remember the one I had as a kid, I also remember it being a bit of a disappointment. Maybe second time round I'll appreciate it more. My first home computer was a Sinclair ZX81, 1K of RAM, although I had a wobbly 16K RAM pack, and a flat membrane keyboard. No colour or sound and just a hint of fragility. Then I got my VIC-20. It looks so good in the ads with a proper keyboard, colour, sound and the promise of high resolution graphics. It was the friendly computer, but I was a nerd and I wanted to do programming. And although the keyboard was great, the slightly vague 22 character colour text was difficult to use after the crisp 32 character monochrome ZX81 and the high res graphics weren't as easy to access as I expected. It also only had 5k RAM and 1.5k of that was used by the display. So not long after I moved on to a BBC Micro, which I kept for many years. But did I really give the Vic a fair chance? Well now I've picked up this beauty from a well-known online auction site, an original lightly used and working Vic 20. Compared to a ZX81 it's a solid bit of kit. The bread bin design is iconic and it still doesn't take up too much space unlike a BBC Micro. We get several expansion options including a cartridge slot and an Atari compatible joystick port. The keyboard has four function keys to the right which give it a little bit of character. One modern addition I have is a gamepad. Gamepads weren't really a thing back in the day and I don't really like joysticks so this Atari compatible joypad in a retro style is ideal for me. I also have this rather fetching dust cover. Both the dust cover and the gamepad were bought new from the same online auction site as the Vic itself, although all from different suppliers. For a modern user, the Vic has the big advantage of a composite video output, so if you've got the right cable, you can connect to a telly without too much faff. I mentioned the cartridge port earlier, and that's going to be a feature of this video because A, I don't have a Commodore tape deck or any tape software, and B, tapes can be a massive pain in the backside. I like cartridges. Their instant access can contain any memory they need, so no RAM expansion is required, but still come as media you can physically hold and collect, complete with cover art and other stuff. That still holds true for modern retro gaming. Now back when I was a kid, there was one game I had that I really did like, and it came on cartridge, and it was called Avenger, and here it is. Unfortunately I don't have the box, but I do have the original insert with instructions. I remember that these cartridge games required the screen to be positioned with the cursor keys, so don't be worried about a horizontal offset when you plug one in. And there it is, just as I remember it. It's a good quality, colour, high-res, noisy version of Space Invaders. This game was the first time I experienced something close to a real arcade game at home, and I played it for hours. One feature of Avenger I really liked was the arcade style score table. There was no need for it on a home computer game, but to me that added something extra to the experience. My friend Mike also had a VIC-20, and he had Omega Race. This was based on a 1981 vector graphics arcade game made by Midway. There's a really nice startup screen, and you also get a bit of background on the story of what's going on. Based in the near future, it predicts the dominance of mobile operating systems. That was a little joke I just made. Very funny. 
Considering the VIX high-res graphics aren't really all that high-res, it does a pretty good job of recreating vector graphics through some funky programming tricks towards the display. And by funky, I mean clever, not smelly. The shooting angles are a bit restricted, but the game is still very playable. Gorf is another Midway Arcade clone. Fun fact, Gorf stands for Galactic Orbiting Robot Force. It has four missions, each of which is like an 80s shooter in its own right. The arcade game had five missions, but for copyright reasons, the Galaxian mission was removed from many home computer versions, including the Vic one. And now for the strange tale of Jelly Monsters vs Pac-Man. Jelly Monsters was a version of Pac-Man made by Commodore. However, Atari had acquired the rights for home use, and so Commodore had to remove Jelly Monsters from sale. Atari Soft released its own version of Pac-Man for the Vic, but most people who know think Jelly Monsters is better. Microsoft released a whole load of arcade clones on cartridge for the Vic. This version of Williams Defender struggles a bit with the horizontal scrolling, but it's just about playable. That's no mean feat on the Vic 20. This version of Galaxian has choddy graphics, but plays remarkably well. It's colourful and responsive, like a vending machine condom. Atari even got into the Nintendo world with this decent version of Donkey Kong. And now for the whole reason I was disappointed with my VIC-20 as a kid. I wanted to program. So I've got this 1982 computer mag with an article on VIC-20 high-res graphics. And here, next to an ad for a ZX81, is said article. And I'm going to type in this listing just like people did back in the day. As you can see, the characters look huge on the screen and I'm having to get used to the keyboard layout as it's not quite like a standard PC.
All done. So what is the reward for all this effort? Here we have a half screen sine wave plot. It's made by filling the screen with characters and then redefining each one to create a bitmap screen, which is quite a kerfuffle. It's much easier to do on a ZX81, albeit with a blocky graph. And on a BBC Micro, it's just super easy and proper high res. So you can see why I found the VIC-20 frustrating. Development for the VIC-20 didn't die in the 1980s, and here we have two cartridges from this century, both from the future was 8-bit. The first is Cheese and Onion, an astonishing platformer by Misfit that pushes the VIC to its limits. It needs a 32k expansion, but that's not a problem if you're using the cartridge version. The graphics are amazing for a VIC, especially the parallax scrolling effect and the gravity and bounce physics, which are a step up from most original 8-bit games. It's simple to play and fun too, so not just a graphic showpiece. The second cartridge is Penultimate Plus 2, which isn't cheap but has everything you need for a VIC-20. The utilities menu offers some useful programs, including a self-test option. You can set up just about any RAM configuration you want using the function keys. If you want to try some hands-on VIC programming, then there are loads of tools in the development section. You can set your boot preferences if you want to keep the cartridge as a permanent fixture, and why not? Because there are also a whole load of game images sorted alphabetically or by type. Which means you can run classic games like Grid Runner without touching a tape. All the future was 8-bit titles are there too, so you can play more recent games like Vic Nibbler 2. Cheese and Onion is also there. So is the VIC-20 better second time round? Yes, yes it is, and for three reasons. One, I've got a gamepad for it. Two, I can get everything I need on a cartridge. And three, I have no need to program it anymore. I hope you enjoyed my video, thanks for watching.